get right to it today. You know, this is uh, this is Christmas Day, and uh, one of the great things about Christmas and Christmas Day for we who are performers is that nobody listens. They're all out running around, and we can do the things we want to do. Now, uh, first of all, I want to get right down to the to, to the to the heart of it. Uh, I have received over the past year. I've received probably a total of. Oh, I would guess maybe four or five hundred letters from kids and from different types of people asking me to do this particular story out of my book, In God We Trust, All Others Pay Cash. Now, this is the opening chapter, and it has to do with Christmas. Now, uh, one little other comment. I can't read it completely to you because uh, it will be out of context with the rest of the book. But briefly, it's this. Two men are in a bar, and they're talking, and uh, it is just about Christmas time. It's cold, and these two men knew each other when they were kids, and they have not had any contact since. In fact, uh, one of them has remained in Indiana working as a bartender, and he's remained an Indiana-type person, and the other man has gone east and has become almost the epitome of the faith New Yorker. Uh, the kind of guy who doesn't even need credit cards wherever he goes. They just give him stuff, you know. He, uh, he's the kind of man who, who his shoes are, are such fine Italian shoes that they're built completely for cab riding. You can't even walk in them. They're just for riding in cabs. And now the two of them are sitting in this bar back in Indiana. They haven't seen each other for years. And one of them, uh, looking out at the Christmas decorations, he, he says, do you remember... Uh, that particular Christmas, and the other one says, yeah, I sure do. And uh, now is the first story, and the story has to do with Christmas and a Christmas gift. And, and for some reason or other, which I've never been able to quite figure out, Peter Ilyich Tchaikovsky is always identified with Christmas. You notice they don't identify Borodin with Christmas, uh, Rachmaninoff, uh, somehow, no matter whatever Tchaikovsky wrote, he's all, and they also identify Dickens with Christmas. He's always Christmas, too. So would you bring me a little Tchaikovsky there, though? Thank you. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, that's Christmas, all right. All right, and now the entire show this evening will be the reading of this first story from In God We Trust, All Others Pay Cash. Now, this story originally appeared, and I must give them... Uh, official credit. It originally appeared in Playboy magazine a few years back, and the title of it is Duel in the Snow, or Red Rider Nails the Cleveland Street Kid. And the story opens up with a with a big capital letters statement, and it's got quotes around it. Disarm the toy industry, printed in angry block red letters. The slogan gleamed out from the large white button like a neon sign. I carefully reread it to make sure that I had not made a mistake. Disarm the toy industry. That's what it said. There was no question about it. The button was worn by a tiny, indignant type little old lady wearing what looked like an upturned flower pot on her head, and I suspect, viewing it from this later date, a pair of kid tennis shoes on her feet, which were primly hidden by the automat table at which we both sat. I, toying moodily with my chicken pot pie, which, of course, is a specialty of the house, surreptitiously examined my fellow citizen and patron of the automat. Wiry, lightly powdered, tough as spring steel, the old doll dug with old lady gusto into her meal. Succotash, baked beans, cream corn, side order of Harvard beets. Bad news. A vegetarian type. No doubt, also a dedicated cat fancier. Silently, we shared our tiny automat table as the great throng of pre-Christmas quick lunchers eddied and surged in restless excitement all around us. Of course, there were the usual H&H club members spotted here and there in the mob, out-of-work SEAL trainers, borderline bookies, ex-opera divas, panhandlers, trying to look like a Madison Avenue account man just getting out of the cold for a few minutes. It is an art, the ability to nurse a single cup of coffee through an entire ten-hour day of sitting out of the biting cold of mid-December Manhattan. And so we sat wordlessly, as is the New York custom, for long moments until I could not contain myself any longer. Disarm the toy industry? I tried for openers. 
She sat unmoved, her bright pink and ivory dental plates working over a mouthful of Harvard beets, attacking them with a venom usually associated with the larger carnivores. The red juice ran down over her powdered chin and stained her white lace bodice. I tried again. Uh, pardon me, madam, you're dripping. Eh? Her ice-blue eyes flickered angrily for a moment and then glowed as a mother hen looking upon a stunted dwarf offspring. Love shone forth. Thank you, Sonny. She dabbed at her chin with a paper napkin, and I knew that contact had been made. Her uppers clattered momentarily, and in an unmistakably friendly manner. Uh, disarm the toy industry? I asked. It's an outrage, she barked, causing two elderly gentlemen at the next table to spill soup on their vests. Loud voices are not often heard in the cloistered confines of the H&H. It's an outrage, the way the toy makers are forcing the implements of blasphemous war on the innocent children, the pure in spirit, the tiny babes who are helpless and know no better. Her voice at this point rising to an evangelical quaver, ringing from change booth to coffee urn and back again. Four gnarled atheists, three tables over, automatically, by reflex action alone, hurled four amens into the answering air. She continued, It's all a government plot to prepare the innocent for evil. Godless war. I know what they're up to. Our committee's onto them, and we intend to expose this decadent capitalistic evil. She spoke in the ringing anvil-like tones of the true believer, her whole life obviously an unending fight against they, the plotters, she clawed through her enormous burlap handbag, worn paperback volumes of dogma spilling out upon the floor as she rummaged frantically until she found what she was searching for. Here, Sonny, read this. You'll see what I mean. She handed me a smudgy pamphlet from some embattled group of right thinkers, based, of course, in California, denouncing the U.S. as a citadel of warmongers, profit-greedy despoilers of the young, and promoters of worldwide capitalistic decadence, all through plastic pop guns and Sears Roebuck fatigue suits for tots. She stood hurriedly, scooping her dog-eared library back into her enormous rucksack and hurled her parting shot. Those who eat meat, the flesh of our fellow creatures, the innocent slaughtered lamb of the field, are doing the work of the devil. Her gimlet eyes spitted the remains of my chicken pot pie with naked malevolence. She spun on her left kid and strode militantly out into the crisp, brilliant Christmas air and back into the fray. I sat, rocking slightly in her wake for a few moments, stirring my lukewarm coffee meditatively, thinking over her angry, militant slogan, Disarm the toy industry. A single word floated into my mind's arena for just an instant, canal water, and then disappeared. I thought on, as if the toy industry has any control over the insatiable desire of the human spawn to own weaponry, armaments, and the implements of warfare. <laughs> it's the same kind of mind that thought if making whiskey were prohibited, people would stop drinking whiskey. <laughs> I began to mull over my own youth, and of course, its unceasing quest for Roscoe's, six shooters, and any sort of blue hardware, simulated or otherwise, that I could lay my hands on. It is no coincidence that the zip gun was invented by kids. The adolescent human carnivore is infinitely ingenious when confronted with a peace movement. Outside, in the spanking Christmas breeze, a Salvation Army Santa Claus listlessly tolled his bell, huddled in the doorway to avoid the direct blast of the wind. I sipped my coffee and remembered another Christmas, in another time, in another place, and another gun. I remember clearly, itchingly, nervously, maddeningly, the first time I laid eyes on it, pictured in a three-color, smeared illustration in a full-page back cover ad in Open Road for Boys, a publication which at the time had an iron grip on my aesthetic sensibilities and the dime that I had to scratch up every month to stay with it. It was actually an early playboy. It sold dreams, fantasies, incredible adventures, and a way of life. Its center fold-outs consisted of gigantic Kodiak bears charging out of the page at the reader to be gunned down in single hand-to-hand -hand combat by the 11-year-old killers armed only with hunting knife and fantastic bravery. Its Christmas issue weighed over seven pounds. 
its pages crammed with the effluvia of the good life of male juvenilia until the senses reeled and avariciousness, a growing desire to own everything, became almost unbearable. Today, there must be millions of ex-subscribers who still can't pass Abercrombie and Fitch without a faint, keening note of desire and the unrequited urge to glom on to it all, just to have it, to feel it. Early in the fall, the first ad appeared. It was a magnificently done thing, balanced copy and pictures, superb artwork, and subtly contrived catchphrases. I was among the very first hook. I freely admit it. And now, before we continue, I would like to tell you that this, speaking of Christmas largesse, is uh, old Santa Claus on 710 WOR here in New York City. We're going to continue the uh, the uh, story, but uh, Christmas time or not, our commercials march on. All right. Uh, General Tire, yeah. It's just, uh, here's a safe th- uh, driving tip from General Tire during the busy holiday season. Here's a special tip. Uh, keep your hands on the wheel and, and drive on the road for change. I'll try that one. Gee, that's a fantastically basic uh, safety tip. They're really getting realistic, aren't they? That's right. And don't... Oh, here's another safety tip. Don't engage any fist fights with truck drivers who are much larger than you and have a lot more practice. General Dual Steel Radio, the first polyester and steel radio tire accepted by Detroit for original equipment use. Still a leader. Mount your dual steel radio tires at your local General Tire retailer who wishes you and yours a safe and smiling holiday season. Keep them tires rolling, yeah. If you've got the jumping fig newtons this year, just think of those beautiful tires. They're calm and collected. Thank you. Do you suppose there lives anywhere across this fabulous country a family that has never eaten at Mama Leone's? Maybe there is, and don't you feel sorry for them? Never heard the noise and laughter of our nightly crowd? Never saw their kids light up at the very color and excitement of our decor? Never saw our statues? Never saw our endless wine cellar? And not only that, they probably never saw a parade of food like Mama served. Oh, sure, they've had Italian food before, but so what? They haven't had Mama's antipasto. They haven't had the cheeses and rich hot bread and the enormous desserts that Mama served. And finally, they never, ever had main courses that everything else was built around. We seriously suggest if you have a pathetic friend who's never been to Mama Leone's, change his life. Make a reservation for him immediately and let him see what a great Italian restaurant can be like. Take him to Mama Leone's, where strong appetites are met and conquered. Mama Leone's, 239 West 48th Street, Judson 65151. And now, this is what the ad read. I wonder how many of you guys out there, ex-kids, remember this ad. Boys, at last you can own an official Red Rider Carbine Action 200-shot range model air rifle. This in black, red, and black letters, surrounded by a large balloon coming out of Red Rider's own mouth, wearing his enormous 10-gallon Stetson, his jaw squared, staring out at me manfully and speaking directly to me, eye to eye. In his hand was the knurled stock of as beautiful, as coolly, deadly looking a piece of weaponry as I'd ever laid eyes on. Yes, fellas, Red Rider continued under the gun in a big balloon out of his head. Yes, fellas, this 200 shot carbine action air rifle, just like the one I use in all my range wars, chasing them rustlers and them bad guys, can be your very own. It has a special built in secret compass in the stock for telling the direction if you're lost on the trail, and also an official Red Rider sundial for telling time out in the wilds. You just lay your little old cheek against this stock. You just sight over my own special design cloverleaf sight, and you just can't miss. Why don't you tell Dad it's great for target shooting and varmints, and it'll make a swell Christmas gift? Well, the next issue arrived, and Red Rider was even more insistent now subtly implying that the supply of Red Rider BB guns was limited. And to order now, or see your dealer before it's too late. It was the second ad that actually did the trick to me. It was late November, and the Christmas fever was well upon me. I thought about a Red Rider air rifle in all my waking hours, seven days a week, in school and out. I drew pictures of it in my reader, in my arithmetic book. 
on my hand in indelible ink, on Helen Weather's dress in front of me in crayon. For the first time in my life, the initial symptoms of genuine lunacy, of mania, set in. I imagined innumerable situations calling for the instant and irrevocable need for a BB gun. Great fantasies where I fended off creeping marauders burrowing through the snow toward the kitchen where only I and I alone stood between our tiny huddled family and insensate evil. Masked bandits attacking my father to be mowed down by my trusty cloverleaf sighted deadly weapon. I seriously mulled over the possibility of an invasion of raccoons of which there were then several in the county. Acts of selfless chivalry defending Esther Jane Albury from escaped circus tigers. Time and time again, I saw myself a miraculous crack shot, picking off sparrows on the wing to the gasps of admiring girls and envious rivals on Cleveland Street. There was one dream that involved my entire class getting lost on a field trip in the swamps, wherein I led the tired, hungry band back to civilization using only my Red Rider compass and sundial. There was no question about it. Not only should I have such a gun, it was an absolute necessity. Early December saw the first of the great blizzards of that year. The wind howling down out of the Canadian wilds a few hundred miles to the north had screamed over frozen Lake Michigan and hit Holman, laying on the town great drifts of snow and long story-high icicles and sub-zero temperatures where the ice and the air cracked and sang. Streetcar wires creaked under caked ice, and kids plodded to school through 45-mile-an-hour gales, tilting forward like tiny furred radiator ornaments, moving stiffly over the barren, clattering ground. Preparing to go to school was about like getting ready for extended deep-sea diving. Long johns, corduroy knickers, checkered flannel lumberjack shirt, four sweaters, fleece-lined leatherette sheepskin, helmet, goggles, mittens with leatherette gauntlets with a large red star with an Indian chief's face in the middle, three pairs of socks, high tops, overshoes, and a 16-foot scarf wound spirally from left to right until only the faint glint of two tiny eyes peering out of a mound of moving clothing told you that there was a kid somewhere in the neighborhood. There was no question ever about staying home. It never entered anybody's mind. It was a much hardier time, and Miss Bodkin was a much hardier teacher than the present breed. Cold was something that was accepted, like air, clouds, and parents, a fact of nature, and as such could not be used in any fraudulent scheme to stay out of school. My mother would simply throw her shoulder against the front door, pushing back the advancing drifts and stone ice, the wind raking the living room with an angry fury for an instant, and we would be launched, one after the other, my brother and I, like tiny astronauts, into unfriendly Arctic space. The door clanged shut behind us, and that was it. It was make school or die. Scattered out over the icy waste around us could be seen other tiny, beferred jots of wind-driven humanity, all painfully toiling toward the Warren G. Harding School, miles away over the tundra, waddling under the weight of frost-covered clothing like tiny frozen bowling balls with feet. An occasional piteous whimper would be heard faintly, but lost instantly in the sigh of the eternal wind. All of us were bound for geography lessons involving the exports of Peru, reading lessons dealing with fat cats and dogs named Jack. But over it all, like a faint, thin, off-stage course, was the building excitement. Christmas was on its way. Each day was more exciting than the last, because Christmas was one day closer. Lovely, beautiful, glorious Christmas, around which the entire year revolved. Off on the far horizon, beyond the railroad yards and the great refinery tanks, lay our own private mountain range, dark and mysterious, cold and uninhabited, outlined against the steel gray skies of Indiana winter, the mills. It was the Depression. And the natives had been idle so long that they no longer even considered themselves out of work. Work had ceased to exist, so how could you be out of it? A few here and there picked up a day or so a month at the roundhouse or the freight yards or the slag heaps at the mill. But mostly, they just spent their time clipping out coupons from the back pages of True Romances magazine, coupons that promised 
virgin territories for distributing ready-made suits door-to-door or offering untold riches repairing radios through correspondence courses. Downtown home in Indiana was prepared for its yearly bacchanalia of peace on earth and goodwill to men. Across Holman Avenue and State Street, the gloomy main thoroughfares, drifted with snow that had lain for months and would remain until well into spring, ice-encrusted, frozen drifts along the curbs, were strung strands of green and yellow Christmas bulbs and banners that snapped and crackled in the gale. From the streetlights hung plastic ivy wreaths surrounding three-dimensional Santa Claus faces. For several days, the windows of Goldblatt's department store had been curtained and dark. Their corner window was traditionally a major high-water mark of the pre-Christmas season. It set the tone, the motif, of the giant Yuletide Jubilee. Kids were brought in from miles around just to see the window. Old codgers would recall vintage years when the window had flowered more fulsomely than in ordinary times. And this was one of those years. The magnificent display was officially unveiled on a crowded Saturday night, and it was an instant smash hit. First-nighters packed earmuff to earmuff, their steamy breath clouding up the sparkling plate glass, jostled in rapt admiration before a tinkling golden panoply of mechanized electronic toys. This was the heyday of the Seven Dwarfs and their virginal den mother, Snow White. Walt Disney's seven cutie pies hammered and sawed, chiseled and painted, while Santa bounced Snow White on his mechanical knee, ho, ho, ho through eight strategically placed loudspeakers, interspersed by choruses of hi-ho, hi-ho, it's off to work we go. Grumpy sat at the controls on a miniature eight-wheel Rock Island Road steam engine and Sleepy played a marimba, while in the background, inexplicably, inexplicably, Mrs. Klaus ceaselessly ironed a red shirt. Sparkling artificial snow drifted down on Shirley Temple Dow. Flexible flyers and tinker toy sets glowed in the golden spotlight. In the foreground, a frontier stockade built of Lincoln logs was manned by a company of kilted lead highlanders who were doubtfully fending off an attack by six U.S. Army medium tanks. Hitler has always been vague in Indiana. A few feet away stood an Arthurian cardboard castle with Raggedy Andy sitting on the drawbridge, his feet in the moat, through which a Lionel freight train burping real smoke went round and round. Dopey sat in Amos and Andy's pedal-operated fresh air taxi cab beside a stuffed panda holding a lollipop in his paw, bearing the heart-tugging legend, Hug Me. From fluffy cotton clouds above, the Dion quintuplets, the dolls wearing plaid golf knickers, hung below billowing parachutes, having just bailed out of a high-flying Balterwood Falker triplane. All in all, Santa's workshop made Salvador Dali look like Norman Rockwell. It was a good year. Maybe even a great one. Like a swelling Christmas balloon, the excitement mounted until the whole town tossed restlessly in bed and made plans for the big day. Already, my own scheme was well underway. My personal dream, casually, carefully, calculatingly, I had booby-trapped the entire house with copies of Open Road for Boys, all open to Red Rider's slit-eyed face. My father, a great John reader, found himself for the first time in his life in alien literary waters. My mother, grabbing for her copy of Screen Romances, found herself cleverly euchred into reading a Red Rider sales pitch. I had stuck a copy of Open Road for Boys inside a cover showing Clark Gable clasping Loretta Young to his heaving breast. At breakfast, I hinted that there was a rumor of loose bears in the neighborhood and that I was ready to deal with them if I had the proper equipment. At first, my mother and the old man did not rise to the bait, and I began to push, grow anxious, and of course, inevitably overplayed my hand. Christmas was only weeks away, and I could not waste time with subtlety or droll innuendo. My brother, occasionally emerging from under the daybed during this critical period, was already well involved in some private little brother persiflage of his own, involving an erector set with motor, capable of constructing drawbridges, Eiffel Towers, Ferris wheels, and operating guillotines. I knew that if he got wind of my scheme, all was lost. He would then begin wheedling and whining for what I wanted which would result in nobody scoring. 
since he was obviously too young for deadly weapons. So I cleverly pretended that I wanted nothing more than a simple, utilitarian, unpretentious Sandy Andy, a highly symbolic educational toy popular at the time, consisting of a kind of funnel under which was mounted a tiny conveyor belt, a little scoop-like gondolas. It came equipped with a bag of white sand that was poured into the funnel. The sand, trickling out of the bottom into the gondolas, sent the belt in motion. As each gondola was filled, it moved down the track to be replaced by another, which, when filled, moved down another notch. And endlessly they went, dumping sand out at the bottom of the track and starting up at the back loop to be refilled again, on and on and on, until all the sand was deposited in the red cup at the bottom of the track. The kid then emptied the cup into the funnel, and it started all over again, ceaselessly, endlessly, senselessly, round and round. How like life itself. It was the perfect toy for the Depression. Other kids in the neighborhood had their own little things going, but through my brain, nightly danced visions of six guns snapped from the hip and shattering bottles and annoying nameless frenzy of impending ecstasy. I figured one day I'm going to have to bring it right out in the open. In fact, bringing it out in the open almost brought the whole scheme down. One morning, my mother, leaning over a pot of simmering oatmeal, suddenly asked out of the blue, catching me off balance, what would you like for Christmas? Horrified, I heard myself blurt before I could stop, a Red Rider BB gun. Without pausing or even missing a stroke with her tablespoon, she shot back, oh no, you'll shoot out one of your eyes. It was the deadly mother BB gun block. I was sunk. That deadly phrase, you're going to shoot your eye out, used many times over by hundreds of mothers, was not insurmountable, or was not surmountable by any means known to kid them. I had really booted it. Such was my mania, my desire for a Red Rider carbine that I immediately began, however, to rebuild the dike. <laughs> I was just kidding. Uh, even though Flick is getting one, that was a lie. I uh, guess, um, I'll tell you what I'd like. I sure would like a Sandy Andy, I guess. <laughs> I watched the back of her Chinese red chenille bathrobe anxiously, looking for any sign that my shaft had struck home. They're dangerous. I don't want anybody shooting their eyes out. The boom had been lowered. I was under it. With leaden heart and frozen feet, I waddled to school, bereft, but undaunted. At recess time, little knots of kids huddled together for warmth amid the gray, craggy snowbanks from the howling gale. The telephone wires overhead whistled like banshees while the trapeze rings on the swings clanked hollowly as Schwartz and Flick and Bruner and I discussed the most important thing next to what I'm going to get for Christmas, which is what I'm getting my mother and father for Christmas. We talked in hushed, hoarse whispers to guard against security leaks. The selection of a present was always done with great secrecy, in fact, more so than that which surrounds a State Department white paper on underground subversive operations in a foreign country. Schwartz, his eyes darting over his shoulder as he spoke, leaned into the wind and hissed, I'm getting my father. He paused dramatically, hunching forward to exude, to exclude unfriendly ears his voice dropping even lower. We listened intently for his punchline. A new flip gun. The sheer creative brilliance of it staggered us for a moment. Schwartz smiled smugly, his earmuffs bobbing jauntily as he leaned back into the wind, knowing he had scored. Flick, looking suspiciously at a passing female first grader who could be a spy for his mother, waited until the coast was clear, and then launched his entry into the icy air. For my father, I'm getting... Again, we waited. Schwartz, with a superior smirk, playing faintly on his chap list. I'm getting a rose that squirts. We had all seen these magnificent appliances at George's candy store, and instantly we saw that this was a gift anyone would want. They were bright red celluloid with a white rubber bulb for pocket use. At this moment, luckily, the bell rang, calling us back to our labors before I had to divulge my own gifts. I had been working on a magnificent selection of gifts for both my brother and my mother, but I had not yet made the final choice. The first for my mother was a tasteful string at Woolworth of beads about the size of small walnuts, brilliant ruby in color with tiny yellow flowers embedded in the glass. 
The other, and a more expensive gift, a dollar ninety-eight, was a pearl-colored perfume atomizer, urn-shaped, with golden lion's feet and matching gold top and squeeze bulb. It was not an easy choice. It was the age-old conflict between the classic and the sybaritic, and that's not easily solved. For my father, I'd already made the down payment on a family-sized can of Simon Eyes. One of my father's favorite proverbs, and one he never tired of quoting, was motorist wise, Simon Eyes. He was as dedicated a hood shiner as ever bought a fourth-hand Graham Page. In fact, I asked him one night over supper, I'll bet you can't guess what I'm getting you for Christmas, Dad. Instead of saying, hmm, he answered by saying, uh, let's see, is it a new furnace? My father was the worst and toughest and most dedicated furnace fighter in the entire history of northern Indiana. His battles with the furnace were epic. As far as my kid brother was concerned, it was just merely uh, a matter of uh, deciding. It was either going to be a rubber dagger or a Dick Tracy Jr. crime fighter disguise kit containing false noses and a book of instructions on how to trap crooks. It's not easy to pick something for your kid brother. But one day, we had decided to go to Goldblatt's, Toyland, a snowy throne, which was where Santa Claus was enthroned for that year. Red and white candy canes under a suspended squadron of plastic angels blowing silver trumpets in a glowing golden grotto sat the man, the connection, Santa Claus himself. In northern Indiana, Santa Claus is a big man, both spiritually and physically. And the Santa Claus at Goldblatt's was officially recognized among the kids as being unquestionably the Santa Claus in person. Eight feet tall, shiny, high, black patent leather boots, and a stomach. I mean a real stomach, no pillows. A long line of nervous, fidgeting, greedy urchins wound in and out of the aisles, shoving, sniffing, above all waiting, waiting to tell him what they wanted. It was my last chance to tell Santa Claus. In those days, it wasn't easy to disbelieve fully in Santa Claus, there wasn't much else to believe in. Kids used to argue, but nobody really took a chance. Well, I wasn't taking any chances. And so my kid brother and I waited in line for our turn. Behind me, a skinny seven-year-old girl wearing a brown stocking cap and gold-rimmed glasses hit her little brother steadily to keep him in line. She had green teeth. He was wearing an aviator's helmet with the goggles pulled down over his eyes. His galoshes were open, and his maroon corduroy knickers were damp. Behind them, a fat boy in a huge sheepskin coat stood numbly, his eyes watering in vague fear, his nose running red. Ahead of my brother and me, a long, uneven procession of stocking caps, mufflers, mittens, earmuffs, inched painfully forward until, way off in the far, far, hazy distance, in his magic glowing cave, Santa Claus sat each in turn on his broad red knee and listened to exultant dream after exultant dream, whispered, squeaked, shouted, or even sobbed into his ear. Closer and closer we crept. My mother and father had stashed us in line and disappeared. We were alone. Nothing stood between us and our confessor, our benefactor, our patron saint, our dispenser of BB guns, but 297 other besiegers at the throne. I have always felt that later generations of tots, products of less romantic upbringing, cynical non-believers in Santa Claus from birth can never know the nature of the true dream. I was well into my 20s, in fact, before I finally gave up on the Easter Bunny. And I am not convinced that I am the richer for it. Even now, there are times when I'm not so sure about the stork. Over the serpentine line roared a great sea of sound, tinkling bells, recorded carols, the hum and clatter of electric trains, whistles tooting, mechanical cows mooing, cash registers dinging, and the faint, far-off ho-ho-hoing of jolly old St. Nick. One moment, my brother and I were safely back in the tricycle and Irish mail department, and the next, the next instant, we stood at the foot of Mount Olympus itself. Santa's enormous, gleaming, white snowdrift of a throne soared ten or fifteen feet above our heads on a mountain of red and green tinsel carpeted with flashing Christmas tree bulbs and gleaming ornaments. Each kid in turn was crowded up a tiny staircase at the side of the mountain on Santa's left as he passed his last customer onto his right and down a red chute back into oblivion for another year. Pretty ladies in dress, dressed in snow-white costumes, gauzy gowns glittering with sequins and tiaras clipped to their artificial hair, 
presided at the head of the line, directing traffic and keeping order. As we drew near, Santa seemed to loom larger and larger. The tension mounted. My brother was now whimpering steadily. I heard him ahead of me, while behind, the girl in the glasses did the same with her kid brother. Suddenly, there was no one left ahead of us in the line. Snow White grabbed my brother's shoulder with an iron grip, and he was on his way up the slope. Quit dragging your feet, kid. Get moving. She barked at the toiling, tiny figure climbing up the stairs. The music from above was deafening. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way, sung by 10,000 echo-chambered, reverberating chipmunks. High above me, in the sparkling gloom, I could see my brother's yellow and brown stocking cap as he squatted briefly on Santa's gigantic knee. I heard a booming ho, 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 and then a high, thin, familiar trailing wail, one that I had heard billions of times before as my brother broke into his primal cry. A claw dug into my elbow, and I was launched upward toward the mountaintop. I had long before decided to level with Santa, to really lay it on the line. No Sandy Andy, no kid stuff. I was going to ride the range with Red Rider. Santa Claus was going to have to get the straight poop. And what's your name, little boy? Ho, ho, ho. His booming baritone crashed out over the chipmunks. He reached down and neatly hooked my sheepskin collar, swooping me upward. And there I sat, on the biggest knee in creation, looking down and out over the endless expanse of toy land and down to the tiny figures that wound off in the distance. Uh, 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 that's a fine name, little boy. Ho, ho, ho. Santa's warm, moist breath poured down over me as though from some cosmic steam radiator. Santa smoked camels, like my Uncle Charles. My mind had gone blank. Frantically, I tried to remember what it was I wanted. I was blowing it. There was no one else in the world except me and Santa Claus and the chipmunks. Uh, uh, ho, 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 wouldn't you like a nice football? My mind groped. Football, football. Without conscious will, my voice squeaked out. Yeah. My football. My mind slammed into gear. Already Santa was sliding me off his knee and toward the red chute, and I could see behind me another white-faced kid bobbing upward. I want a Red Rider BB gun with a special Red Rider sight and a compass on the stock with a sundial. I shouted. Ho, 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 ho. You'll shoot your eye out, kid. Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas. Down the chute I went. I had never been struck by a bolt of lightning, but I know how it must feel. The back of my head was numb. My feet clanked leadenly beneath me as I returned to earth at the bottom of the chute. Another Snow White shoved the famous free gift in my mitten, a barely recognizable plastic Kris Kringle stamped with bold red letters, Merry Christmas, shop at Goldblatt's, free parking, and spun me back out into Toyland. My brother stood sniveling under a counter, piled high with raggedy Ann dolls. From nowhere, my mother and father appeared. Did you tell Santa Claus what you wanted? The old man asked. Yeah. Did he ask you if you've been a good boy? No. Ha, don't worry. He knows. Anyway, I'll bet he knows about the basement window. Don't worry. He knows. Maybe that was it. My mind reeled with the realization that maybe Santa did know how rotten I had been and that the football was only a threat, was actually a punishment. There had been for generations on Cleveland Street a theory that if you were not, quote, a good boy, you would reap your just desserts under the Christmas tree. Maybe that was it. Well, the next few days groaned by, day after day, until finally Miss Bodkin, our second grade teacher, gave us an assignment to write a theme. What would we like for Christmas? A theme. That's my chance. I'll write it down on the theme. Maybe it'll get back to my mother. I remember writing that theme. I can remember the words exactly. What I want for Christmas is a Red Rider BB gun with a compass in the stock and this thing that tells time. I think everybody should have a Red Rider BB gun. They are very good for Christmas. I don't think a football is a very good Christmas present. It came back, and in red letters, Miss Bodkin had marked, B+, plus. you'll shoot your eye out. Even Miss Bodkin. Miss Bodkin. Ah, but then Christmas always arrives. Time creaked down slowly. And sure enough, five o'clock in the morning, with the dawn just cracking out, over the long, far-off, gone, those mills in the distance, gray light, I am down, running down the stairs, looking at the Christmas tree. I couldn't believe my eyes. There, under the Christmas tree, a long, thin package. I ripped it open. It was a Red Rider BB gun. A Red Rider BB gun. 
I had it scored. It was mine. I rushed out into the cold. I set up the target on the steps, the target that came with the Red Rider BB gun. I set it up, and I moved off into the snow a good 20 feet, slammed the stock down into my left kneecap, my beautiful new Red Rider BB gun, holding the barrel with my mitten left hand. For the first time, I sighted down over my brand new cold barrel, and slowly, softly, I squeezed the frosty trigger. For one instant, I thought, the gun doesn't work, it's broke. We'll have to send it back, and then, crack! The gun jerked upward, and for a brief instant, everything stood still. The target twitched, a tiny tick, and then a massive wallop, a gigantic, slashing impact, crashed across the left side of my face. My horn-rimmed glasses spun from my head into the snowbank. For several seconds, I stood, not knowing what had happened, warm blood trailing down over my cheek and onto the walnut stock of my new BB gun. I lowered the barrel convulsively. The target still stood. A ragged, uncontrolled tidal wave of pain throbbing and singeing rocked my head. The ricocheting BB that had bounced off the steps had minced my eye by maybe a quarter of an inch. A nasty, angry, bloody welt extended from my cheekbone almost to my ear. It was divine retribution. Red Rider had struck again. Another bad guy had been gunned down. My glasses. Frantically, I scrambled my glasses. There they were, pulverized, broken. I put the cold, busted horn rims back on my nose. And then I could just make the blur of my mother's Chinese red chenille bathrobe in the door. I could hear her voice. Be careful. Don't shoot out your eye. Be careful now. She hadn't seen. Rapidly, my mind evolved a spectacular story of how my little brother had stepped on my glasses and that I'd scratch my head on the door. I sipped the bitter dregs of coffee as I sat in the horn and hard eye remembering that long-forgotten day in the past, that Red Rider BB gun, and the time that I had actually almost shot my eye out. Red Rider had struck again. And I wondered as I looked out into the Manhattan street whether Red Rider was still dispensing retribution and frontier justice as of old. Considering the number of kids I see around with broken glasses, I suspect he is. And don't forget, kid, Merry Christmas. But be careful. You're liable to shoot your eye out. You're liable to shoot your eye out.